Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Data Center Knowledge webcast, How to Put Your Mission Critical UPS and Battery Assets to Work for Your Bottom Line, sponsored by Eaton. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help widget on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. And if at any time you have audio difficulties or issues with advancing of the slides, please hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. Today's web seminar is being recorded and will be available on demand for 12 months starting tomorrow. You'll receive an email when it is ready. Please submit any questions you may have for our speakers today via the Q&A widget. Our speakers today are Ed Spears, Technical Marketing Manager at Eaton, and James McBride, Energy Storage Growth Manager at Eaton. And with that, the floor is all yours, Ed and James. Thank you, and welcome everybody to our webinar uh, today. And we will be talking about ways to use your UPS and battery power infrastructure in data centers and other mission critical applications to work for your bottom line. This is part of an everything as a grid initiative and as we're familiar with power grids, but also things like information, entertainment, and other services can be provided as a grid as well. But today we will be talking about a power grid and the way we're used to thinking of the power grid is consumers of the electricity that's supplied by that grid. Basically a one-way street where we consume power and uh, we pay for that power once a month, but the amount we pay depends on how much we use, how frequently we use it, and how much we use it with a given amount of time. So what we're going to be discussing today is more of a bi-directional relationship with the grid where the power infrastructure that you've already invested in can be used for other capabilities beyond just the basic battery backup and power conditioning that we're used to with our UPS systems and batteries. Just to note about what we already know, energy costs in the data center have always been a big piece of the operating cost, and they continue to be so not quite as dramatically high as we expected 20 years ago, but it's still a big chunk of the actual cost for data center operation. A megawatt of data, or one megawatt data center consumes about 160 million kilowatt hours of energy over 10 years. And importantly, the UPS system that you deploy has some electrical losses that typically account for sometimes five to 10% of that monstrous energy user. Our usage now, of course, uh, it's closer to 5% than 10% than it was a few years ago, but still a significant amount. And of course, the folks in the C-suite, the CEOs, CIOs, CFOs, are interested in saving money through higher efficiency usage of that power for both supporting the data center and its cooling capabilities. And additionally, we find they do in fact use sustainability and green operation being a good corporate neighbor as having a positive impact on their brand value and almost surprisingly that's just as important to these folks as is the monetary savings so the reality is in most data centers our clients and our other users have large battery banks and large amounts of power infrastructure that often sit unused now, of course, the UPS is vital technology for any data center, but the finance folks come in and they took a look around and they say, well, this is a huge investment in batteries and power electronics. It takes a lot of valuable footprint. It has a significant upfront cost and some ongoing uh, uh, OPEX costs in terms of things like battery replacements every five to six years, consumable devices like filters and fans and other moving devices inside the UPS that have to be replaced. So I need maintenance contracts uh, for both the UPS and the batteries. And of course, as we said, may have to replace those batteries every five to six years, which provides some disruption to data center operation. So what are we getting for this huge investment that we're making? And the answer comes back from the data center manager, well, it provides backup for us during power outages. And the finance folks ask, well, how frequently do we have power outages? The answer is not very often, but when they do happen, we have to have protection from that. So a UPS system and its associated costs are a necessity. So obviously, finance folks are looking for a way to monetize this huge investment and have it become less of a drag on their monetary picture and more of an asset. So let's see how that can be done. If we look, we see a convergence of mission-critical power, which we're familiar with, 
but also the energy storage application, which you may not be as familiar with. We look at mission critical first, we see the traditional things we would expect. UPS systems and batteries. Nowadays, lithium batteries comprise approaching 30% of the market, especially in larger three-phase UPS systems. There's probably a generator out in the backyard, which has long been the method for providing long-term battery backup and support for the UPS and the rest of the infrastructure, including cooling, of course. But there are challenges that we know about in terms of getting a permit to install the generator in the first place, limits to how long I can run it, how much diesel particulate I can expel into the air. Those kind of things are challenges that are getting more and more important as we go forward with traditional long-term backup. And of course, energy is a big piece of the operational expense and green initiatives are constantly uh, being evaluated and compared on return on investment basis to make sure that they're getting the most out of the power that they do use. So looking along the bottom half of the slide here, here's the energy storage picture. First of all, we would point out that the electric vehicle business has driven the cost of lithium batteries down absolutely dramatically, especially in the last three to four years. And so it makes lithium batteries a uh, viable alternative to traditional UPS batteries, and they have some benefits that we'll discuss here. At the same time, the grid operators and the utility companies are sponsoring incentives uh, and, uh, and uh, methods of paying for things like handling uh, peak, uh, peak shaving uh, and taking advantage of time of use rates and things like that because it's in the utility's best interest to do so. The grid operators, the large grid operators, provide uh, energy policies, which they will also provide remuneration for in terms of things like grid regulation, frequency regulation, the ability to help the uh, grid operator balance the demand on their grid. And it turns out that both of these capabilities, mission critical power backup and energy storage can be embodied in one UPS and battery system. And that's what we're here to discuss today to see how that can be done. Okay, so if I look in the data center application, for example, and there's a UPS system there, and maybe I'm contemplating an energy storage system so I can take advantage of renewables, I can help to monetize some of this investment. And if you look at the block diagrams in this slide, you see the blue block diagram of a traditional UPS system consists of the parts that we would expect. I've got a connection to the grid. I've got a step down transformer and switch gear. I've got a rectifier that converts AC to DC and charges up the battery. And the inverter takes DC power from the battery or the rectifier and basically converts it to AC and sends it out to the critical loads in the data center. And that's traditional UPS operation. But if I look on the right-hand side of the slide, the orange block diagram, which would be for an energy storage system, notice how many of the blocks are in fact the same. I still have a grid connection, still need a transformer, still have switch gear. Now I need a battery charger and maybe a relatively large battery combined with a charger, by the way, that's about 50% of the cost of one of these energy storage systems. And note that I could superimpose that directly on the blue blocks on the left. In other words, if I already have a UPS and battery, I might need a bigger battery for energy storage, but I already have most of what I need to allow the system to function as both IT equipment power backup and possibly an energy storage system with a longer battery. So that's a significant realization when uh, data center clients and other mission critical clients are contemplating the use of an energy storage system. And by the way, none of this would really be viable without the advent of lithium batteries. And lithium batteries are used now with UPSs, not just because they're smaller and lighter, and they are, but they also have a much longer service life in a UPS application, 10 to 15 years. They may last as long as the entire UPS system does. And as a result, uh, that's an important uh, reason to choose a lithium battery for a UPS, but the most common reason, besides the small size and lightweight, is the high ability to charge and discharge repeatedly without wearing those batteries out. Traditional UPS batteries can provide a few hundred charge discharge cycles and they're done. Whereas lithium battery vendors tell us that they can handle as many as thousands of charge discharge cycles over a 10 to 15 year life, 
And that capability opens the door for lithium batteries to be used in these kinds of applications where the UPS is being used as an energy management device and may need to charge and discharge its batteries multiple times a day, dozens of times a week or a month. So are all lithium batteries the same? That's what we're showing here on this slide. Uh, this shows several different lithium chemistries that are available for use in a UPS. And for these applications for grid tied uh, 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 requirements we're typically using for looking for a high specific energy. So if you look at the two uh, charts on the far right there, you see the specific energy is very high compared with the ones on the left. That translates directly to longer backup times and more ability to run for a long period of time if necessary. Specific power, on the other hand, is the, uh, uh, is the benefit of the two chemistries on the left and they provide the capability of dumping a lot of energy very quickly into a load, like we often see in data center applications that may have power battery backup power requirements of less than five minutes. So we have a choice of chemistries and products available, but for energy storage application and dual purpose UPS, the higher specific energy is usually gonna be the first choice. So let's review the evolution of mission critical power. UPS system and battery it primarily is there to provide power conditioning and battery backup in the event of a problem with the incoming utility power. We also keep in mind that over the previous three or four decades, the uh, tolerance for power anomalies of the critical devices that we're supporting has become greater, lessening the need for the UPS to provide power conditioning, but it still does, along with that battery backup. But the big reason to have a UPS for a lot of clients is simply to get them onto their generator and condition the power from that, power, that point forward. And that's an activity that doesn't happen that often in mostly uh, uh, you know, here in North America. It's a rather uncommon event to see a power outage that lasts more than a few seconds. But it's still extremely critical that it work and that it work every time. So redundancy and overheads built into the power system uh, in multiple places, we use dual uh, corded architectures and plus one redundancy catcher systems, all kinds of elaborate ways to make sure that we always maintain critical battery backed up power into that data center. In lead acid, the batteries have traditionally dominated the market, but generally they have to be replaced, all of them, on a five to six year uh, replacement cycle. Some of the smaller ones have to be replaced every three years. Some of the newer and better ones can go seven years, but still that means I'm gonna be changing the batteries once or twice during the lifetime of the UPS system that I purchased to work with them. So the industry adoption of lithium batteries, as we said, is accelerating already at an amazing rate. All of us in the industry are, uh, are uh, quite surprised by the, uh, the interest level and the actual uh, amount of lithium that we're shipping with our large UPSs. So they provide a longer life, up to eight times the charge discharge cycle rate compared to traditional batteries and enables us with new ways to use the UPS and batteries. So let's get specific about how we might use a UPS and battery system to monetize that investment and get some revenue stream from it. So on the left-hand side of the slide, we see that we might want to reduce operational expenses through cost avoidance. And one of those possibilities shown here is demand charge management. Uh, demand charges are basically set typically uh, based on the amount of peak energy you may use, uh, maybe only once a year for 15 minutes, but that sets a recurring monthly demand charge that gets tacked onto your utility bill. And this may not sound like a huge thing, but some of our data center operators tell us that 30% or more of their electric bill every month is comprised of demand charges. If they can avoid those demand charges, if they can avoid setting those peaks on the hottest day of the year or the coldest day of the winter, then they're going to basically positively impact their power charges for the next 12 months. So if I could use a UPS system and its inherent battery for peak shaving, then that would be an ideal capability there that could provide direct monetary benefits. The other one here on the left-hand side is time of use op optimization. Many data centers and large enterprises, uh, as well as residences, are subject to time of use rates in some utility and some grid operators' locations, which means that the power can cost much, much more during the peak periods of the day, late in the morning, late in the afternoon, early evening, whereas obviously the peaks or the valleys in between those peaks 
is taking place late at night, early in the wee hours of the morning uh, prior to 5 a.m. So the power cost for these customers varies depending on when they use it. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to skim some power off of my UPS battery during the peak times where the power cost may be many, many multiples of what it is on average, and then during the time when the power cost is at its very lowest, one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, that's when I recharge those batteries and top them off if necessary. So these are ways to reduce operational expense through cost avoidance. Now looking towards the right-hand side here, the other possibility is to generate direct revenue to your organization through existing utility programs and grid operator programs. So the first one that's shown here says demand response. And you're like, well, didn't we already talk about that? Well, demand response is different than demand charge management. Demand response, you want to look at that from the perspective of the utility company or the grid operator. They need to balance the loads on their grid to make sure that they don't suffer huge peaks in demands. And by the way, huge valleys and reductions in demand when they have more capacity than they need. So they need to balance that out. And if they look at a UPS and battery system along with the solar farm out back and the wind farm down the road and the other campus with 20-some UPSs and batteries, all together as, as uh, distributed energy resources, this actually allows, if they can control these distributed energy resources, allows the local utility or the grid operator to balance their uh, uh, demand. And so these are called demand response programs. And the reason this is important is the grid operator has to provide enough capacity all the time. What if they may not have enough on the hottest week of the year? Well, then they have to build a peaker plant, a smaller power plant, typically natural gas powered, but it has to be built and paid for. It has to be kept in a mode of operation where it can be brought online very, very quickly. So it has to be kept in a warm state. And all of this maintenance and ongoing cost and upfront cost of peaker plants is borne by the rate payers. So if they, uh, the utility can avoid the need to build and maintain a peaker plant by utilizing these distributed energy resources that are already there, already available, that's a huge benefit to the utility company and they pay the operators of the distributed energy resources to take advantage of these existing programs. Another one down in the corner is the frequency regulation market. If you think about the utility's incoming frequency or you're building at all, you know it's 60 hertz, at least in this part of the world. But during the times of day or times of year when the load is heaviest, the frequency tends to sag. Wouldn't it be nice if a UPS system or many UPS systems together could utilize uh, their batteries and actually push power back onto the grid, back feeding the incoming power and pumping up that utility frequency and helping the utility company regulate it. By the same token, at one o'clock in the morning when the loads are light on the local utility, the frequency tends to creep higher. It's not allowed to do that, so they would normally have to take expensive measures to bring that frequency down, but if all of their distributed energy resources can use that time to recharge their batteries or charge them up to a certain point, then that allows the, uh, the uh, distributed energy resources to add demand to the grid at the time when the utility company actually needs added demand to keep their frequency under control. So the common thing and the takeaway from this whole slide is there is money to be made. Okay, so this next <clears throat> slide here uh, shows uh, uh, the preference to a uh, video that we're going to show that gives you uh, a little bit of a chance to take a look at this pictorially and see both the concepts we've been talking about and also the way it works in a typical UPS system with batteries. I'm going to press the play button and provide some commentary. Let you guys read the uh, subtitles and I'll hit the high points. Plenty of renewable energies out there and folks generally want to take advantage of them as opposed to continuing to use fossil fuels in all cases or in every case. But the availability of that renewable energy, solar, winds, obviously harder to predict. Well, how do they balance? How do they know they're going to have enough when they need it? If they're not able to balance it, the results can be power blackouts. But a UPS system or a solar or wind farm with batteries can support the grid as well. Data 
data centers are an ideal uh, application to do this because they tend to be such large users of power in a given geographical area. So here you get an idea of the kind and the amount of uh, uh, the amount of compensation that can be avoided, that can be uh, taken into, into account. Okay, let's talk a little bit more specifically about how this actually works. If you're a UPS geek, then you already know that these drawings on this page are power flow diagrams through a traditional UPS. And by the way, this is done with a traditional UPS, just special firmware and lithium batteries. So on the far left, we see normal double conversion operation. Power comes in from the utility company. It hits the rectifier part of the UPS where it's converted from AC to DC. And then part of that DC goes to charge the battery or keep it topped up off if it's already charged. And then the inverter takes DC and builds a new AC output 24 7 365, sends it on out to the critical loads. The static switch and bypass circuitry is only needed if the UPS becomes overloaded or suffers a failure. So in these modes, the UPS is supporting the IT equipment load just like we always expected to. The battery is fully charged. Let's move to the middle picture here. This is a situation where we need to provide some demand reduction for the local utility company or grid operator. So how are we going to reduce our demand from the utility without reducing the amount of power that we deliver into our data center? Well, that's where the battery comes in. You see this incoming red arrow here is still the same. We're still converting power from AC to DC, DC back to AC, but the battery is involved now. Now, we're not hitting the battery with the super fast steep discharge rate. Think of it more as skimming the energy off of the battery slowly and under a controlled situation, but the battery is basically helping to support that critical load. And if we use the battery to support some of the critical load, what does that mean for the AC input? means we're not going to be drawing as much from the utility company. Maybe we only do this for a few minutes on a few days a month. Maybe we do it for 30 minutes at a time. So a longer battery or a bigger battery is beneficial here in terms of how much return you might get on the investment. But the fact is, this, uh, especially if you look at a campus environment where I have many, many UPSs and batteries that are aggregated by software to act like one big UPS, this can actually be enough of a demand reduction to move the needle and help the utility company uh, on uh, a, a time when their uh, demand is at its highest and they need some reduction. And again, they will pay you for participating in these kinds of programs. Now, over on the right-hand side, let's take a look at a situation where we need to add demand to the grid. Okay, so now you can see, in addition to supporting the IT loads, we are also charging the battery. Well, what if the battery is already charged? Well, in this operation, we do have the option with lithium batteries to maintain the battery system, for example, at about an 80% state of charge or less. That gives us some headroom to charge the batteries during times where we actually need to add demand to the grid. So, of course, when you look at all these things, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, this battery and this UPS is number one priority is to provide X number of minutes of backup time for my data center, and I don't want to be messing around with that or changing that in any way. So when this is set up by the user or the operator, a certain amount of battery time, battery capacity is held in reserve and never used by these programs. So the client can always rest assured that I have, let's say, 10 minutes of uh, battery backup time uh, held in reserve for the critical load under any and all circumstances. If I use some of my extra battery capacity to support these programs, I do not use that minimum level that I'm required for data center operation. Now, why would we, uh, uh, why would we have uh, uh, a situation uh, where we need to do the or operate the battery this way? Uh, well, if I have a redundant system or a UPS system that's not fully loaded, that means that I have some extra capacity that I may not be using day in and day out. So let's put it to work because we can get paid for it. Okay, moving along. So the overarching idea here is we're expanding the role of the UPS. So first of all, on the left-hand side, you see safety here. 
not just physical safety, but safety for your critical loads that you're supporting with the UPS. So the battery is partitioned as we described in the previous slide and always maintains critical backup. We in fact power share with the local utility. There's no leap of faith and it's highly fault tolerant. This is something that is a well-known and well understood capability and capacity and it's not a new technology from that perspective. We also utilize dedicated communication uh, for interface to the grid. This uh, should be clearly understood that it's always up to the end user if they want to participate in a dual purpose type arrangement here or an energy aware type arrangement with their UPS. They can always enable it or disable it whenever they want to. And they can also receive a request from the local utility that says, hey, do you guys want to participate for two or three hours this afternoon or not? And they make the decision, it's all on them. But if they want the most financial compensation, they can receive an electronic signal directly from the grid operator that says, we need to use some of your battery capacity. And they enable it instantaneously and disable it uh, when necessary, again, without impacting the minimum battery needed to support that data center. That gives the utility company the most flexibility. You may have thought that, well, why don't we just do this with our generators? And you can, and so many clients do. But a generator takes a while to start up and stabilize, and sometimes there's limits on how long you can operate that generator in many municipalities, whereas a UPS system with battery is instantly available and doesn't have those kinds of restrictions. The alternative, on the other hand, is that you typically can't run for as long as you could a generator, assuming you're allowed to. So flexibility, static or dynamic response, totally up to the user or can be done by remote control. Uh, it's a load independent response, and I can do this with a single small UPS or a huge multi-module, multi-megawatt parallel UPS. They all work together. And we mentioned before that aggregation is the ability to basically pull together a bunch of UPSs in your building or on your campus or in your geographical area. So they all work together. The ones that are running low on battery, they drop off automatically and the load is distributed to other UPSs. The aggregation software makes this work and makes it work seamlessly so that from the utility and the grid operator's perspective, it's like they have one huge distributed energy resource that operates totally automatically when they need it. And then there's the versatility. We want to have energy cost optimization and demand response, like we talked about peak shaving time of use rates before. Local energy management or photovoltaics, electric vehicles, investment deferrals. This uh, is part of that type of picture where the end user has better control and better management of the energy that they use and when they use it and how long they use it without impacting critical operations to get paid for participating. And these ancillary services that we also talk about, like frequency regulation and what's called dispatchable load, are part of that as well. Microgrids and generator supports uh, can well be a, a part of this type of uh, application, too. So specifically, the benefits listed here, green credentials. We're supporting a migration, like the video showed, towards renewable power, and we're replacing reserves based on fossil fuels. So we're using renewable power like batteries, fuel cells, solar and wind, and replacing reserves that would be based on fossil fuels, which might be suboptimal. And then there's the whole point about revenue and savings. You optimize that energy cost, you provide a new revenue stream that wasn't there before by using power quality investments that you've already sunk. They're already there waiting for the next power outage. Isn't it better to make use of that investment and uh, have it be an asset rather than uh, a detriment on the grid. And then there's com improved competitiveness. If I'm a large colo operator or hyperscale data center, I may be competing with other uh, data center services offerings. And if I can reduce my power and cooling costs by improving efficiency or taking advantage of these features, then I'm going to be more competitive for a given client than the co-location house down the street. So those kind of things enter into the, uh, the decision as well. So as we get near uh, uh, closing here, the future grid, the grid of the future needs fast, flexible, and cost-efficient reserves. And it would be nice if they could be done 
with sustainable and renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuels. So a grid responsive or an energy aware building can help to support higher penetration of renewable energy in their application and in their facilities, multiple facilities if I'm a large operator. I can replace reserves that are now based on fossil fuels. It's a smarter use of existing assets and provide some new earning models. And at the same time that I receive these benefits, I can have flexibility and security, those details that matter. And of course, the end user client has to feel absolutely comfortable with these capabilities. Uh, and that's why it's always uh, uh, given to the end user to make decisions whether or not to participate, when to participate, how long to participate, or maybe not to participate at all if local conditions warrant. So as we get near to the Q&A session here, let's go through a, a couple of uh, points here. The question is, is my facility a candidate for a grid interactive or dual purpose UPS? And there's really about uh, five questions here that will give you most of what you need to know or most of what your grid operator needs to know. Does the facility rate structure include high demand charges? Many do, if not most. I'm talking about peak penalties or tariffs, uh, basically, charges that you are assessed usually every month or every quarter based on how high your electricity demand is at its peak because the local utility company and the grid operator have to handle your facility at its peak. They can't tell you, well, we're, we're going to run out of energy today. You can't go that high. Demand charges are there so that they have enough capacity to handle your facility under its worst possible case condition without delay. Next. Does the facility rate structure include things like time of use rates? Some parts of the country, some utility operators and grid operators involve time of use rates. Others negotiate special flat rates for the data center operator and are they optimum? Time of use rates vary based on the time of day as we saw earlier. Is the facility already integrating solar infrastructure or wind power? Surprising the number of data centers that are doing this, and it's not just data centers, it's large commercial industrial operators as well. So they may want to optimize their self-consumption and bring in the capacity for power conditioning and battery into that organization. Does the customer participate in demand response programs today? And before you say no, think about it. We have some data centers that do this with their generators other commercial, industrial, and data center facilities who do this kind of thing simply by saying, we're going to reduce our lighting loads at certain times a day in this entire large building, and that can make a big difference. So if they're already participating in demand response programs, this is just an extra level above that that they can use with, uh, in addition to things like load shedding techniques or offloading to gensets, as we mentioned. Are there other energy management challenges that they're looking to address? So those kind of things can be uh, many and varied, but usually it has to do with the facility itself. Was it wired to handle uh, the kind of power usage that I'm going to be needing on a regular basis nowadays? Uh, do I have to expand the facility or can I continue on for X number of years with the infrastructure that I have by optimizing and multiple use of things like UPS and batteries? So if you're interested in more information, please visit our website at eaton.com slash energy aware. And with that in mind, I think we'll go ahead and open up four questions for anyone that, uh, that has any questions. Remember to use the chat and uh, we'll respond to those right here online. Okay, great. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started with our questions. All right, so first question, is this available for any UPS or is it Eaton only? Right now, we and some of our competitors are in the process uh, of developing this. Our capabilities are already on the market, so it is available today. Can I do it with any UPS? The, uh, the feature requires the addition of some firmware for controls and then a small electronic controller box that provides communication with the local utility and with the lithium ion battery system, and it can be set up by the user <clears throat> or by the field service engineer that handles the UPS to participate in these existing uh, utility energy programs. So even if you have an existing UPS, we do use lithium batteries with these, but if it comes time for battery replacement, 
you consider a lithium battery, it provides better data for us to use when operating in this manner. And you can certainly, with a very minimum <clears throat> investment beyond what you'd already planned, can take advantage of this capability. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Data centers are typically risk adverse and need to ensure their uptime. Do you feel that the financial executives override the technical folks to allow operating their UPSs for financial benefits? That's a really good question. And the, the uh, gut reaction would be no. Reliability is the most important thing. Keeping that data center available and up and running is the overarching concern. And that is still true. But if we look at history, we know that over the last 10, 15 years, we've gone from that initial attitude that says data center availability is the most important thing. In fact, it's the only thing to what we see today where the folks that make the decisions are saying, hey, we must have that availability and reliability. But at the same time, we must design our system with an eye towards cost. And that's the new piece. And it has been very difficult to talk them out of that, uh, that attitude now because they recognize the huge upfront cost and the ongoing cost for maintenance contracts and battery replacements. And as a result, they're making sure that when they deploy a new data center or they retrofit an existing data center, that there must be an eye towards cost and efficiency improvements both for the power and for the cooling. And Ed, I'll, I'll add on to that a little bit. You, you know, traditionally these these conversations and ROI evaluations have have kind of happened separately, right? You've got you've got a conversation about do I need a UPS and the associated resiliency that it adds, and you've got a separate conversation within potentially that same organization about do I need battery energy storage? And, and today that's that's becoming a more integrated conversation. What, what's the value of power resiliency? And how do I monetize battery storage? And if that can be achieved with one asset and you could check both of those boxes, it just becomes a, an ROI story that, that increases the speed of, of payback. Um, and, and that's starting to happen more and more as, you know, especially large data center facilities are more and more interested in, in their green footprint. So it's, it's uh, something that's evolving, but it is happening a lot more. Absolutely. Okay, great. Great. All right, next question. If the lithium batteries are smaller, does that mean you will need a larger footprint slash space to replace traditional batteries? I'm worried about space changes in some data centers, data centers that are limited. Well, that's a good question, and the answer is a positive one. If I'm using a traditional UPS battery with five or 10 minutes of battery backup, for example, my lithium battery is going to be, for the same backup time, is going to be dramatically smaller and lighter. So that also allows the capability of saying, instead of retrofitting with another 10-minute battery, maybe I could put a 30-minute lithium battery in the same physical space without having to build anything out. And that now opens the door to my ability to participate at least short term in these kind of energy and manage management initiatives we've been talking about today. So a lithium battery is going to give you some advantages in footprint. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Next question. I use my generators for ener energy management already. What are the additional benefits of using my UPS for this purpose? Yeah, as we know, generators can be, uh, in most cases, run for long periods of time. But we do know that some local municipalities are now regulating how long you can run your generator and how much particularly you can put in the air. But at least that can give you some hours of uh, ability to participate in these programs. So what does a UPS and battery give you that a generator doesn't already give you? Well, it eliminates those restrictions, especially environmental and permitting restrictions and things like that. But the big benefit is a UPS and battery is instantly available. Sometimes the utility company will only need your participation for a few seconds to a few minutes, but they need it right now. If we wait for the generator to start and stabilize, the opportunity is lost and the remuneration is lost. So by having a device that can react instantaneously for a short or a longer term, it gives you uh, at least an extra facet of uh, capability and ability to generate revenue. 
and, and tacking onto that, Ed, also what, what you'll see with different energy programs that are made available by various utilities is, is that the faster the dispatch time required in the program, the higher the payout is. So you can participate in some subset of, of available programs across the uh, across the country with a genset, but what you'll what you'll find is that most of those are the slower response time programs that, that typically uh, have a lower payout. So that the the highest payout will be some combination, most likely, of a of a battery for the shorter, faster response times, and then potentially even using that genset if there are not additional permitting challenges and issues with emissions. Um, to, to handle the longer run time programs. Okay, great. There have been numerous fires associated with lithium ion EE ESS systems. How is Eaton dealing, dealing with this risk? A very good question and it's top of mind for a lot of folks that are considering or deploying lithium batteries. So the good news is we as an industry have had experience with this now and we now as a provider of these kinds of solutions do feel very comfortable with the safety profile of these kinds of devices. Now why is that? Well the biggest reason is that lithium battery uh, in large formats like these are required to have something called a BMS or a battery management system. That is different from a simple battery monitoring system that tells you when something is amiss. A management system has the ability to do a much deeper level of analysis of things like temperature and voltage balance and uh, uh, the actual performance of each individual cell in the battery. And if something is trending in the wrong direction, of course, it'll issue an alarm. But if action is not taken to mitigate, the management system will act on its own to disconnect a battery that's acting up before it can get to the point where it might become a safety hazard. So that's automatic. It's built into every lithium battery system that would be deployed with the UPS today, uh, at least a uh, larger UPS today. And then there's the designs of the batteries themselves, which are intended for uh, use in outdoor applications under high stress applications. And the design of the battery and the battery system is such that even under abusive conditions, the battery is designed not to be able to generate more heat than it can dissipate. So if it can always dissipate more heat than it generates, that precludes the possibility of a thermal runaway event and provides an extra level of safety on top. So overall, you still need to keep the battery in a controlled environment. You still need to pay attention to the battery. It never pays to ignore any battery on any UPS. But we do, again, feel very comfortable with the safety profile of the uh, lithium battery systems that we offer. And our competitors in the industry would tell you the same thing. Okay, great. Next question. Who do I contact at a utility regarding such programs? Well, I know that it's sometimes the grid operator's representative and sometimes the local utility. But James, you may be able to comment uh, uh, on uh, exactly what the most likely path should be. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it'll be slightly different depending on the utility. Um, but just about just about every region has some level of programs in place. Um, a, a, the, the first call would be to your actual utility and, and reach out to see if they actually have a program. Um, by, by the way, if you're if if you're working with Eaton equipment, we can we can support that conversation as well. We have relationships with many of those uh, of the utilities around the country. Um, there are also entities called aggregators, which what 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 these companies do is they go out and negotiate. Um, energy storage contracts with many of the utilities, and then they go out and subcontract the the actual performance of the energy storage uh, with, with many sub sub entities. Um, and and there's a handful of those. There there you know you could you could look them up on the internet and figure out who they are in your region. Uh, but if you want to contract directly with the utility, uh, you, you would contact that the energy manager of that utility directly, um, and can work with them to actually enroll your assets. Some of them will have minimum size requirements to enroll, and, and the, the rules vary slightly by, by uh, uh, geographic region and specifically what the programs are for that region, uh, but that, that particular utility could uh, give you the ins and outs of that program that's available there. And it does vary depending on the utility company or the geographical location. We've noticed, for example, in California, 
where, like most of the rest of the country, they're required to offer these kinds of programs to their client base. But in California, they're not only required to offer them, they're required to advertise them. In other words, make their customers aware that these programs exist and here's how much you can make depending on conditions and depending on some requirements and things like that. Whether I'm an individual residential customer or a giant commercial customer, they actually have a little bit easier ways to, uh, to get into the uh, proper channel within the local utility and say, I want to participate in program X. How do I do it? So that's going to spread across the country as we go and become easier. Okay, great. Next question. Can you also backfeed the grid from the battery through the rectifier? That's absolutely what we can do for those things we mentioned uh, in the slide presentation, like uh, frequency regulation. In order to perform that, we have to be able to use the battery and the rectifier as a bi-directional device. So instead of just taking AC power in from the grid, we actually use the uh, battery, convert it back to AC, and backfeed the grid in such a way as to support the utilities or the grid operator's frequency and voltage regulation. Okay. If switching from traditional batteries to lithium, do you need to rip and replace the entire system, or is it more of a retrofit? Well, the answer is in some cases you can retrofit, but in most cases the lithium vendors that are providing batteries for this application are most fixated on minimizing the footprint and size, so the batteries may not be the same physical size or shape as the ones that you already have, so that means that you'll be taking out both the cabinetry and the existing battery, but replacing it with a much smaller, compact, and lighter weight uh, alternative. Uh, there will be cases, though, and we see a huge business for battery retrofit with lithium, where we will be able to, uh, uh, to, be able to deploy new lithium batteries in an existing cabinet. But for now, I would assume that I would be replacing both the existing battery and its cabinetry uh, when I retrofit with lithium. Okay. Could or would the utility companies pay for the cost of firmware upgrades in existing UPSs and in purchasing these new units? I don't think that's out of the question. I don't have specific examples. I would say that the firmware upgrade part is such a small piece of the, uh, the cost as opposed to retrofitting a battery that uh, that may not be uh, uh, the path to go. But uh, I think the utility companies recognize that the more of these distributed energy resources they can encourage to bring online, the easier time they're going to have and the less likely they're going to have to make giant investments in things like peaker plants uh, to basically sit there most of the year and only run for a couple of weeks, uh, but uh, have to be maintained in a hot standby mode, which is hideously expensive. So uh, we're seeing evidence already that utility companies are doing anything they can to make it easier for uh, their large customers to participate in these kinds of programs. Okay. Um, excuse me, how does the battery warranty change given this application? Well, what we see, and we pass through warranties from our lithium vendors, but we're seeing a warranty on the performance of the battery of 10 years for typical lithium installations with three-phase UPSs. If we ask the vendors how long do they really think they'll last, they're uh, consistently saying 10 to 15 years, and 15 years is close to the entire service life of a given large UPS, which would last, say, 15 to 20 years. So the battery may last almost as long as the UPS. If I'm retrofitting an existing battery, after five years, a traditional battery, it's nice to know I can retrofit with one that I won't have to change out for the rest of the life of that UPS. But the short answer to the question is 10-year warranties on the performance of the batteries with an expected life of up to 15 years. But the 10 years is warranted. And, and Ed, you touched on this earlier in the presentation, but I, I think this, this ties in also to the, the one of the key points about this presentation, which is, um, you know, every one of these energy programs have slightly different rules in, in different locations, right? And, and one of the keys to making this all work is, is careful selection of of the battery to be deployed, right? So there, there, there's uh, we often talk about lithium batteries as a monolithic block of uh, of equipment, right? But the the reality is that there's multiple types of lithium batteries within that 
within that category. You, you have NMC, you have lithium phosphate, and then even within those different chemistries, you, you have batteries that are targeted for a higher cycle count versus longer standby operation versus higher temperature. You can optimize a blend of the chemistry of lithium batteries in many different ways. Uh, so the key here is, is understanding the, the program that you wish to enroll in, what's available in your region, and, and what the payout is, and, and how frequently are the assets called in that region, and how long is the duration of the, uh, of, of the call. And then making sure that you are tying that into the, the battery that's being selected and deployed in that location. Okay, great. Next question. I always run into data center operators that say, no way am I touching this, the UPS or GEN. There's too much risk. What have you found is the best response to this? Well, we would certainly comment, uh, as we did during the presentation, that when this is set up uh, either by the user or by their service engineer, the original purpose and specifications for having that UPS are maintained and not adjusted or messed with in any way. In other words, if they need 10 minutes of battery backup for a certain amount of load, we never drop below that or we never uh, uh, change that uh, capacity equation so that they can always feel comfortable that no matter what happens, they'll have the amount of backup that they need to support that critical load. Now, that being said, we are using the UPS and its battery for dual purposes here. Uh, and uh, I would comment that this doesn't involve uh, a lot of, uh, if any, mechanical switching or moving parts or anything like that that could wear out or impact the reliability of the system. The vast majority of this is firmware. So uh, those kind of things uh, give the customer a little better comfort level that uh, we're not going in there and, and uh, uh, dramatically changing the normal operation of the UPS. The, Double conversion online UPS op application with battery re remains and is retained throughout any application of, a, of an energy aware uh, capacity. Okay. Uh, next question Does Eaton man manufacture its own lithium batteries? We do not at this time. There's uh, Several vendors now globally uh, that uh, dominate the uh, lithium battery industry and lots of other vendors that are offering some very uh, uh, attractive uh, capabilities and prices and, and uh, technical details and things like that. But at the moment, just like for our traditional UPS batteries, we don't actually make the batteries. We're in the power electronics piece of that business. And uh, we just recognize that the battery is an absolutely critical part of the uh, process, whether we're using it for data center support or hospital medical imaging applications, factory floor automation, whatever. But we don't make uh, uh, batteries of any type today. Okay, next question. How do you calculate the ROI for a larger LI ion battery and the monetary benefits for the DR program participation? Uh, that's a very good question, and we have some tools that can help with that. But in general, we're looking at, uh, from the battery perspective alone for the moment, we're looking at uh, a battery system in a traditional application where I'd be planning for battery maintenance contracts every year, replacing the battery every five years from a budget planning standpoint, and uh, how much does that cost, how much does the battery price rise in year 10 and year 15. Those kind of things can be uh, put into a tool and used to calculate, and then you contrast that with a lithium battery that may cost a bit more on day one, but I only have to plan for replacements at the 10-year mark, if not later down the road, and as even possibility exists for less maintenance uh, uh, requirements and a, a less elaborate maintenance contract because the battery management system in a lithium battery does so much of that, and that kind of thing is going to uh, improve it in its accuracy and, and uh, deployment down the road. But that can give you a very apples-to-apples -apples comparison of the, uh, the battery investment. But the bigger piece of it, uh, as you uh, mentioned, was the entire uh, demand response program participation. How much does the utility company pay and how can I predict? And uh, the utility companies help us with, it, with that by giving us information that says in this geographical area, we can expect that we would need your participation about this percentage of the time in these months of the year. That type of information is available up front. They're not guaranteeing that, 
but it giving an idea of how much will I make if I invest in a dual purpose uh, UPS and how soon will I get my money back? That's an obvious big question here. And uh, we found, uh, uh, and James can corroborate, uh, returns on investment in the three to five year range are very common. Yeah, and, and another, another, you know, maybe a simpler way to, to look at it, if, if that facility is looking at energy storage, it, it becomes a much, a much easier conversation. And, and I can tell you, by using your UPS to, to do this dual purpose operation, it'll be a faster return on investment than if you deployed external energy storage. And, and it goes back to what Ed was saying earlier, right? It, to deploy energy storage, you're going to have to run a power feed. You're going to have to have some kind of switch gear, uh, you know, powering that, that energy storage. You're going to have an inverter and you're going to have a battery. All of that infrastructure exists in that facility if they have a UPS. So, so really at that point, the only investment becomes a, a slight oversizing of the battery in order to align it with the with, with the requirements of that energy program, which would be needed anyway. Um, so I, I think it, it, it's much simpler if that facility already has um, a desire to deploy energy storage. Um, it becomes a much, much simpler uh, conversation because you already have a, a large chunk of that facility infrastructure in place. Um, and, it, and if not, if it's just a, a, an initial first pass evaluation, it's, it's a matter of how much the payout is and, and statistically, you know, each of these programs either publish or by requesting, you can get a, uh, a, a statistical analysis of what the average call of that program is and how often it's, it's called. And, and that information is used to set up the battery and, and analyze the degradation of the battery based off of it and in turn the, the, you know, the investment needed over time in order to, uh, to achieve that program. Okay, great. Um, can you give us more information on who we should contact at Eaton to continue further discussions and opportunities? What we would do is recommend that uh, uh, you contact your local Eaton uh, uh, sales representative or sales organization. If you go to the website eaton.com slash energy aware, and energy aware is spelled out like one word, that will give you a lot of the information we've already discussed today, along with direct information as to who to contact so that we can give you a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, type of meeting and discussion of your particular application and requirements and see how we might fit in. Great. Well, it looks like we're just about out of time today. Uh, great discussion with our audience. But before we go, we'd like to thank you both, Ed and James, for today's informative discussion. This web seminar will be available on demand starting tomorrow, so please feel free to come back and review. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks for attending.